Okay. Hi, I'm Luann from Rock and Book Reviews, and I'm excited to be here today with Michael Nathanson, the author of the fantastic new book, uh, Cries of the Eagle. Have you got that there? Thank you. I do. I do, Luann. <laughs> Pleased to meet you finally. <laughs> Same here, and I I lent my copy to a friend. So <laughs> oh. Thank you. And uh this is just a really fantastic book. I was so impressed, Michael. Um, so oh, what inspired you to write that book? It was uh, a, a couple of things, really. I had had in my uh, mind and heart, uh, coming from a family of writers, uh, that one day there might be a, a book coming out of me at some point. Uh, it certainly wasn't in my earlier years, but I think what really began to inspire this book is uh, a business trip, extended business trip in the early 1980s to the Middle East. It was the first time I had visited a Middle Eastern country and come in contact with the uh, culture uh, and religion of Islam and uh, was immersed in it long enough to, to really uh, see some things and was, was uh, just interested. So I, I post-trip studied some of it, read historical accounts, and, and kind of uh, took an interest in it just because I had been there and spent some time there. And then as uh, time passed and the um, uh, raising up of the radical Islamic jihadist movement uh, manifested itself here uh, in the U.S. and around the world, uh, I took more of an interest in it, and, um, you know, a story began to develop. I had had some friends when I was in uh, that period of time in the Middle Eastern country who were Muslims, uh, who were, were just fine people. They had families, they had children, they, they, they were, uh, uh, like the rest of us, working to make a living and, and uh, you know, trying to do their best in each and every day, and, and they certainly were not like these people that uh, we read about uh, in, in so many uh, uh, terrible events. And um, so a story began to formulate uh, in my mind. I, I thought with post 9-11, there was a tremendous amount of uh, absorption of this terrorism uh, aspect of life as, you know, this is everybody, this is all. Muslim people, you know, we, we began to villainize uh, the entire, uh, you know, world of, of Muslims, uh, 1.6 billion of them. Uh, it's a very large population. Uh, so in my mind, I, I just had a story developing where I thought I wanted to show a couple of things. One, uh, that there could be a person, there could be an individual that was indeed uh, different, uh, that was indeed a patriot. Uh, in America that happened to be of another religion, a different culture, but uh, was uh, very much a, uh, a proud patriot and uh, one who did not uh, support terrorism. And uh, also through the book, uh, I have a bit of an evangelical uh, thread woven in it. And uh, I wanted to show that um, maybe as a counterpoint to the uh, radical Islamic view, that there is another view, that there is another far more loving and uh, living and loving uh, God that showed himself to us uh, and that there was another way uh, to consider other than the radical Islamic view. And so the story developed and characters developed and I uh, uh, started working on this. Uh, as I said, I came to writing later in life and had been in business all my life up, up to the point where I said I better I'd better do this before I get too old and feeble and my brain forgets what I wanted to do. <laughs> it's, uh, a it's a fantastic story. Well, uh, you're so kind. I, I do appreciate stated, that. You stated you're from a family of writers. Uh, what other writers are there? I know your father wrote The Dirty Dozen, correct? Yes, ma'am. Uh, he, he did, yes. How much input did he have in Hollywood when they made the film? He was one, uh, he did have some involvement in the film. Uh, he wrote one of four manuscript screenplays for the film. Uh, 
Uh, interestingly, though he was the author of the book, his screenplay was not the one that was used. It was actually uh, oh, really? yeah, a screenplay by another uh, more experienced screenwriter. Uh, two different disciplines, screenwriting and, and the novel writing, uh, two different things. Uh, movies deal with just fractions of time and images and actions that have to speak so much in a very brief, uh, brief camera uh, experience. And so uh, they ended up using a script. Uh, I think the gentleman's name was Nunnally Johnson. He was a, a well-known script writer. But we did, as a family, get to go to uh, London to see the film being made. And we spent time uh, at the uh, uh, Pinewood Studios and uh, actually saw uh, a couple of very uh, important uh, shooting nights of the film. So it was, it was quite exciting. Oh, and he was, exciting. <laughs> he was there in a consultation mode, mildly so. Uh, you know, once the, the director and everybody, you know, gets their mindset, they just go do what they're going to do. But we indeed get to be part of it. It was quite, quite an experience as a young lad. I was, uh, I think, uh, 12 or 13. So it was uh, quite, quite an impression upon me. So how old were you at the time? I was, uh, when we went to, to London, uh, about 12, 13 years old. Just a right young there. boy. Young boy, yeah, yeah. So it was a big deal Just for me. It's a perfect age, age to be impressed with everything. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, got to meet some of the old uh, classic actors, Lee Marvin, Charles Bronson, Telly Savalas, uh, uh, Chuck Connor, uh Jim Brown, goodness, it, it just went on and on everywhere. I, I wasn't especially starstruck, which is why I think they probably tolerated me, and I, I didn't make a nuisance of myself. <laughs> but I'm just kind of in awe of the whole thing, and it, it, it's interesting. That's amazing. Tell us a little more about your childhood. What was it like growing up? Well, I grew up, uh, as I said before, in family writers. My father and my mother were both writers. Uh, grew up. Uh, early years in Los Angeles in the Hollywood Hills. Uh, we lived there. And uh, when I uh, was, I think, in the fifth grade, uh, we moved to the uh, Southern California area out uh, in Orange County by the beach. And I fell in love with the ocean. That's really kind of been in my blood ever since. And uh, spent over 30 years of my life uh, at the beach and developed this tremendous uh, connection with the water and uh, that world. And uh, we used to, every day after school, it wasn't what are we doing today, is when are we going to the beach and <laughs> what water activity are we going to do? You know, we were young water rats and just loved it. And it was, uh, and before it was, crowd and uh, exploded in the population explosion that it, it had in the uh, 70s and 80s. So when I grew up there uh, as a, a young young guy, it was uh, relatively peaceful and uh, uh, just a wonderful experience. Wow. That's, uh, now, you said your mother and father were both writers. Who else in your family were writers? Uh, really no one as far as I know. Uh, it was just, I had no siblings. It was just uh, my mother and father and, and me. So and, what, what did uh, your mother write? Uh, she wrote uh, YA, a young adult. Uh, she was uh, back in the 60s of all things, uh, writing uh, for Random House, the uh, series of books based upon, uh, of all things, the Barbie doll. Uh, there was a whole oh, really. Story. Of, of Barbie does this, Barbie does that, and uh, uh, it, it was kind of a almost a, a Nancy Drewish kind of a series, but based on you know bringing this character to life. Uh, so uh, she I just, wonder if that's where they got their idea when they made the little children's films now <laughs> off the Barbie. I don't know. I don't know. It was so long ago, of course, at this point. And then she she uh, dabbled in some other writing. And actually, she she was quite a good writer. I, I always uh, understood her to be uh, quite uh, articulate in her writing voice. And and uh, she uh, uh, didn't have the the notoriety that uh, my father did with the Dirty Dozen, but uh, certainly also uh, a good writer. 
wow, that's you got a good background in other words. <laughs> well, yeah, a love of a love of story, certainly. Yeah. Um on the part of your story, uh, without ruining it, without this is kind of slightly a spoiler though, uh it talks about um an event with a high school and it is so similar to what happened recently last uh, what was it spring fall mm -hmm. but uh why do you think those things type of things happen can you tell us uh, expand how you got that idea you know it it, it is eerie how uh, closely connected my story is to current events real-time events and considered uh, how far ahead it was written before the event yes. actually happened uh, I, yeah, I like to call my writing faction. You know, obviously it's fiction, it's a novel, but uh, it's based on historical and, and current events and geopolitical uh, situations. I, in studying the mindset of, of the radical jihadists, the view that they have of the Western society and their need to uh, overcome it, dominate it, their willingness to do things that normal people find heinous and to engage in, in some of these things that we have seen done. It was a manifestation of that mindset of the characters within my book that was just something that they had embarked upon and Sadly, you know, it was almost a, a predictor of, of things to come. Uh, but uh, it, it just, just timing just happened to be it's that. It's almost prophetic. I mean, it's, it, I wonder it if they read happened. your book before that happened. No, I, I think not. I, in fact, I'd be surprised, uh, you know, if any of them had. But uh, I... Yeah, it, it, is, it was prophetic, and I have had other people mention that and who have read the novel and been, been kind enough to give me feedback, and they have said, goodness, that, that hits close to home. I mean, that, that's too real, and that did indeed happen later. And so it, 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 it's unfortunately part of that mindset, and uh, I, I think we're going to deal with that for several generations, unfortunately. I like what you said earlier. Um, it's I think people prejudge a group of people uh, and stereotype them, um, regardless what age. I mean, in World War II, the Japanese that were totally American and totally good people, they were almost treated as criminals. Oh yes. You know, during the wartime because of fear of yeah, you know, of them turning on us, and uh, and I think same way with the Muslims right now. It's there's so it's just I think it's so wrong for us to stereotype people because there's so many good in every branch. I know uh, one of the my favorite movies uh, during World War II was I mean of World War II was when um, they really brought out how these soldiers, when they were in a certain situation, they were just individual people fighting for their country, just like the Americans were and the Germans, and, and right. they were really good people. Caught up in circumstances, yes. Right. Yeah. They had no choice. Yeah, I mean, no. most of them were forced into the war, whether they wanted to be or not. That's right. And, uh, but anyhow, I, I just wanted to mention that. I think you, that was a really good point you, you brought up. What is your next big project? Well, I'm working on uh, the second uh, book. Uh, it's a sequel to Cries of the Eagle. It's called Taking the Eagle's Nest, and it continues the story. I'm, oh, probably halfway through it now and expect to be finished before the end of the year. Super. That's exciting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
<laughs> I have another book behind it that I want, I want to get into, uh, a totally different subject matter, another novel uh, that comes after this one, uh, but I have to get this one finished because it was, uh, I felt in my heart that it was the second half of this story. Okay, you've got me curious. What's the other novel about? <laughs> uh, the other novel uh, is, uh, it's a political intrigue uh, novel. Uh, it uh, is in, in the United States, takes place in the United States. Has uh, everything to do with uh, American politics and um, yeah, nothing to do with jihadism or the you know, worldwide <laughs> political. Uh, it's just a completely different subject, but I think one of, I hope that will be of interest. And certainly Is that a horror book? <laughs> yeah, yeah, pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> That's what our politics are about. Now. <laughs> yeah. Uh, oh, oh, don't even, don't even get started. You know, <laughs> it's almost like you can't talk to anyone w with a good open heart about ideas anymore these days, one way or the other. You're just going to get in trouble no matter what you do. <laughs> so I, I just keep my mouth shut. <laughs> just to, my trouble is I don't keep my mouth shut. Well, I get in yeah. I, I've been known to. Uh, yeah, I, I'm with you. In, in heart, I'm with you. Uh, <laughs> okay, in the not, next five to ten years, what are your goals that you would like completed? Well, I, I would like to see Cries of the Eagle turned into a film. I think it has film it potential. Fantastic. I would really, uh, I'm, I'm trying to slowly get connected with people that can take a look at it, have an understanding of the film industry and whether for movie or for television film. I, I just think it's got a good film uh, potential. And so I'd really like to get, as soon as I get done with this, uh, that I'm working on now, the second book, I really want to focus my effort on trying to get Cries of the Eagle uh, into some sort of film film shape. And now, will the second book be the final book in this series? In this series, yes. I think it's going to be the final book. I originally envisioned it as a trilogy, but I think the second book is going to tell the whole story. I think sometimes trilogies are great, but sometimes they're too much people kind of drag them out trying to make that third book and it right. leaves, you know, the reader thinking, why are they repeating themselves? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I don't disagree. I, I, uh, I think I'm right there with you, which is why I've said, all right, this complete story is going to be told with the second book and I'm going to be done with that and move on to another subject. So uh, other than the movie, what's the next goal? <laughs> Oh, well, goodness. Um, you know, we have a new granddaughter, so we are spending a lot of time with her, and uh, uh, she's just one year old, so hope to spend a lot of time uh, involved in her life as she's growing up with our son and daughter-in-law, and uh, um, let's see. I don't know. <laughs> so much to do. So much to do. We, we enjoy training. And uh, we uh, have spent uh, time in uh, a remarkable amount of countries in our lifetime and uh, have enjoyed that thoroughly. I love people. I love other cultures. Uh, as you said, you know, everywhere you go, you meet good people. It doesn't matter where it is. And I found that to be the case. Uh, just, so travel is one of the most enjoyable uh, experiences in life for uh, my wife and I. Is there a particular place you want to travel outside the United States? Oh my goodness. Well, uh, we, we've been, been blessed to be able to go to many, uh, been to Denver. Asia, been to the Middle East, been to Europe. Uh, I would love to go to Ireland. We've never been to Ireland. Uh, love to travel Scotland, never been to Scotland. Um, we love Italy, so in fact, we're planning right now to go back to Italy uh, for an anniversary uh, wow. in the future. So uh, excited about that. And someday, if it's possible, I would love to get to Australia before I get uh, uh, too old to stand the long uh, airplane flight. <laughs> That's fantastic. I'd love to travel, but my husband's not a traveler. So. 
He's not, okay. He likes to stay within the United States. He does not like airplanes. <laughs> you know, we have good friends that are the same way, uh, dear friends, and uh, you couldn't get them on an airplane if you paid them a million dollars. They just have no desire to, to go anywhere other than the country. And there's so much to do here within our own country. We love to get into uh, the car and just go. And oh, we, we've done that so many times. Two years in a row, my uh, daughter just... It was just before her twenty first birthday. She was killed in a car accident. Oh, and, I'm so sorry. Uh, we had a hard time dealing with it. Oh, and yeah. so two years in a row after she died, we just traveled the United States. Yeah. And we hit most states. We didn't there's a few we missed. But we decided just to go the back roads rather than the freeways most of the yeah. time. Uh-huh. It was amazing. Places that I never dreamed of here in the United States. Yeah. I thought you don't need to go outside the United States. There's so many wonderful places. You really don't. There's so much. Get off the highway, you know, and, and go through these towns and smaller cities and so forth. Yeah. Did you do a travel journal of any sort for that? Uh, Not really. We yeah. just just enjoy you know, it. We just we had he had uh, a brother that lived in Rhode Island, mm -hmm. so we went the upper. We went up through the upper states when we went to Rhode Island. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, then he had a brother in North Carolina, so we went down that direction. Yeah. And then he was raised in Florida, so we went on down. <laughs> and then, a lot of territory, yeah. Yeah, and then just went through, you know, the different states between Texas and Nebraska and so forth. And yeah. we just and one and then the second time we went, we did a few other states that we missed the first time, but still we there's still a, about five or six states we didn't make. So <laughs> something else for the next trip. Yeah. <laughs> so that's my goal to get the rest of the United States covered. <laughs> yeah, my wife and I agree that getting to travel anywhere is just some of the best fun you can have while you're on this earth. You know, it's just great. Yeah, just meeting people, seeing places, and all the beauties of the earth. Yeah, absolutely. It helps with the negative. <laughs> it does. It does. It's so nice talking with you. Is it's there any fun. final comments you'd like to make before we close? Well, I am uh, just uh, grateful for your kindness in uh, interviewing me. First of all, even reading my book. Uh, I, I'm so grateful for any reader to take the time because I know it's an imposition on your time to read. And if you uh, uh, take something good from the book, then that makes my heart glad. And it just encourages me to, to keep going to the next story. So I thank you very much for allowing me to join you today. Oh, it's my pleasure. And I understand you are giving away uh, for our giveaway a copy of, a print copy of Cries of the Eagle. Yes, I am. Absolutely. And for U.S., Canada, and uh, ebook for international, correct? Uh, it is the U.S. and Canada, as far as I know, the print book. Uh, it, it can be an ebook as well, though, if, if you like an ebook. Thank you. And once again, thank you for this wonderful interview. It was, oh, and your book is just fantastic. I just hope the listeners will read it. Well, you're very kind. I appreciate that. <laughs> And uh, for now, we want to say, encourage all of you to study the universe through books. And goodbye. Yeah.